fourth grade ELA tech set four, uh, 12 kinds of, the, of ice. Our read aloud goal for today is, mm -hmm. infer the author's message about nature, ice, community, and skating. Okay, think about what ice is like. How would you describe it to someone? The memoir we're going to read next is all about ice. It's called 12 Kinds of Ice by Ellen Bryan Abed. What are the different kinds of ice can you think of? For my dad who gave me 12 kinds of ice and for my sons Nathan, Nathan and Seth who have given it to me again in their blades that spit silver. To Anna Freeman, my very first and lasting friend. So that's a dedication page. The first ice. The first ice came on the sheep pails in the barn. A skim of ice so thin that it broke when we touched it. The second ice. The second ice is thicker. We could pick it out of the pails like pans of glass. We could we would hold it up in our mitten hands and look through it. Then we could drop it on the hard ground to watch it splinter into a hundred pieces. The third ice. The third ice was the ice that would not break. We hit it with the heels of our boots. We tapped it with the handle of an old rake, but the ice stayed firm. My sister and I had heard it coming the night before. We lay in our beds listening to the cold crackling, the maple limbs in the yard. We had seen it coming in the closed round moon. We felt it coming through the windows onto our quilts. We had gone to sleep talking about the ice that would not break because it was this ice that would bring us what we were waiting for. So what kind of ice do you think the author and her sisters are waiting for and why? Field ice. The morning field ice came was like no other. Ice frozen upon our day and at, our, at school we could not think clearly. Math and geography and reading were frozen solid. All day long we, we talked about our first skate and on the way home from school we pressed our faces against the windows on the bus to look at the field ice. The one who saw it first was making the most important announcement of the year. When the bus stopped in front of our house, we raced up the driveway and inside for our skates. We ran down the, to, the, to the neighbor's field where a narrow strip of ice was waiting for us. Never mind the hay stubble sticking up everywhere. Never mind the small space. Never mind the first arguments between hockey sticks and figure skates. Never mind. Field ice was short-lived but glorious. It also spoke of... It also spoke of stream ice. If the nights continued cold, stream ice came quickly after field ice. Dad took us in the car up the road to the stream where we had fished for trout in the spring. We sat down on its hard brown bank to tie up our skates. Then we followed Dad as, we follow, as he followed the stream. Sometimes we stop and lie down on our stomachs. We put our eyes close to the ice to watch the little fish and slender reeds moving in the cold current of the stream. Then we'd follow Dad again until the stream smalled to a brook of bent alders. We followed him into the frozen thicket. We tried to see how far we could skate between branches over stones and around old logs. All afternoon, the stream was ours until it was time to take off our skates and walk back to the car. All the way home, we talked about. So what makes ice, field ice, and stream ice so special to the children in the memoir? Black ice. Black ice was water shocked. Still by the cold before the snow. For black ice, Dad took us in the car a half hour's ride to Great Pond, where on our summer dock we tied up our winter skates. We could see the clouds, the blue sky, the tree edged shoreline in the mirror of black ice beneath us. We could see ourselves in the glass, our long winged spirals, our flashing blades, our new mittens. We skated around islands and in and out of caves. We looked beneath the ice and saw what we could not see in summer boulders and cracks between boulders, black shadows and sunken tree branches, and we saw what was not there, the sullen backs and open jaws of hibernating monsters rising from the lake bottom. 
We made huge backward circles and listed the sharp cuts of our blades. We skated out to the middle of the lake, the forbidden place of frothing whitecaps in the summer. We could hear the ice cracking and groaning as it stretched itself in the cold. We sped to silver speeds at which lungs and legs, clouds and sun, wind and cold raced together. Our blades spit out silver. Our lungs breathed out silver. Our minds burst with silver while the winter sun danced silver down our bending backs. We spend one mile, two miles, four miles down the lake on a day of black ice and silver. Black ice, black shadows, black shores, black islands. Silver blades, silver speeds, silver sun. But black ice did not stay as suddenly as it had come. It disappeared under the cover of the first snow. With the first snow came the time for garden ice. What was our vegetable garden in summer became our skating rink in winter. We made it with boards and snow, a garden hose, and hours of work. In October, after frost had killed the last of the plants, we cleared the garden of rock and root and weathered stalk. We raked the surface until it was level. Dad would lie down on the ground to check for holes and little hills. Then we would rake some more. We put stakes at the four corners of the garden and connected them with a string. We carried the long rink boards that lay piled beside the barn to the edge of the garden. We nailed them to stakes hammered into the ground along the string. Then we waited for the cold to freeze the ground and we waited for snow. When the snow came, we began making garden ice. The step, first step was, ne was snow packing. Everyone worked on this, Dad and Mom, my brothers, my sister, and I. We stamped and packed the snow hard with our boots and shovels. We packed it with our skis. We packed it with the to toboggan on which, one, on which one or two of us sat to be pulled back and forth across the hardening surface. Suddenly, Dad would say, time to get the hose. When it was my turn, I'd run inside the house to the cellar stars, stairs, turn on the light, and descend into the dark, shadowed cellar. The garden hose was curled up by the water tank, a long black snake with its nozzle nose mouth. Dad was waiting by a small hole cut beside the sealed cellar window. I passed the snake's nozzle mouth into Dad's gloved hands. As Dad pulled, I uncurled the black r rubber snake making it easier for it to slide up and out through the hole. When the hose was completely outside, I'd hear the muffled call. Ready? This was my signal. To return on the faucet. Dad sprayed water lightly on the snow while we continued to stamp and pack. Soon, ice patches began to form. We worked until we had to give the surface time to freeze solid. One of us would go inside to turn off the hose and pull it back into the nesting coil beside the water tank. We continued the, these ice-making sessions after supper, just before bed and early in the morning. For several days until there, was, there it was, garden ice. But by then, we didn't call it garden ice. We called it Brian Gardens. It was, it was our Boston Garden, our Maple Leaf Garden, our Montreal Forum. Byron Gardens had lights and music. It had stands at schedules. It had hockey games and an ice show. It had rink managers. It had a locker room. It had fans. It had just about everything that the great arenas had except a roof. But Byron Gardens had the sky, and to us, this was the best roof of all. When Byron Gardens, Gardens was ready, it was 100 by 50 feet of beautiful ice. When Byron Gardens was ready, the whole neighborhood knew. A school bus passed our place going up the hill so everyone could see the ice's glassy surface shining in the sun. The rink is ready, spread from house to house, up and down the road. Everyone was planning to skate. Boy with, little, with old hockey sticks and new skates. Girls with freshly, freshly sharpened figure skates. Little brothers and sisters with their first skates. Everyone was planning their house hours on the ice. But, but when Byron Garden was ready, so were the rules of the rink 
These rules were easy to keep at the beginning of the season because everyone was excited to be on the rink again, but it wasn't long before the boys would get impatient waiting for their hockey hour to come. They would put on their skates early and sit on the snowbanks beside the rink. They would watch the girls skate and occasionally touch, toss a puck onto the ice. One of the boys would retrieve the pat, puck with long, winding glade, glides around the figure skaters. It was time to knock on the window for the rink manager. Mom would come to the door of the shed and announce, An extra five minutes for figure skating. When the figure skating hour was over, the boys leaped onto the ice like stirs out of pens. Pens at the radio. Rodeo, I'm sorry. They made sudden stops and starts. They smacked pat pucks against the boards. They circled forward and backwards. Soon they were lost in a tangle of sticks and arms and legs and voices. Meanwhile, the girls were in the shed, taking out their skates. The shed was attached to the house. We could open the kitchen door and be in the locker room. Large elm stumps were scattered about for seats, state, skate guards, hockey tape, scraps of rag for, for whipping blades. An old mitten, a stray sock, lay about the floor. Old skates and extra laces hung from the beams. Battered hockey sticks stood in racks along the side of the room. Brooms and scrapers stood in the in one corner, while huge shovels called scoops stood in another. Photos of our skating Id idols were taped to the walls. This locker room was where we put on our skates and took them off again. It was where we talked about our jumps and spins. In figure eight, it was where we planned our ice show and dreamt of being in the Olympics someday. It was also where we argued about whose turn it was to sweep the ice to so that it could be ready for so what do you think of the author's dad what is he like and then we'll stop there for today <laughs>